everyone. I am going to be introducing author Fiona Davis in just a second and we're going to be talking about this book which came out this week, The Masterpiece, which I could not wait for. I was so excited to start reading this book. You have no idea because I love all of Fiona's books and this is her fourth book now and I am just thrilled for her. So everybody, here is Fiona. Hi, everyone. I am so excited because I am speaking with author Fiona Davis, and we are going to be talking about her brand new third novel called The Masterpiece, which is out this week, and everybody's looking at the cover as I'm talking about it, and I am so happy that I get to talk to you again. Oh, I am thrilled to be back. Thank you so much. Yeah, I couldn't wait for this book. I, I, you know, we talked about it back in December, and when I saw that it was coming up, I was, I like requested it in Mac Alley like a month ago. <laughs> I was like, please, please, I want to read it, and it is so good. It did not disappoint. I'm, I love your novel so much. You are so great at the historical fiction, and you know about New York City, and it's just. It's like I learned so much from you, and I we talked about it a little bit in December, but I want to hear about how you came upon this story. Yeah, so oh, thank you, first of all, for your kind words. It means so much, you know, to finally get a book out in the world. It's always kind of harrowing, <laughs> and the response has been so wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought about, you know, I was invited actually by a reader at one of my author talks, to go to a backstage tour, like a behind-the-scenes tour of Grand Central. Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And we went all over. We put on hard hats and joined this architectural wow. students. And so we really got this great tour up to the catwalks, you know, on the windows, way, way down below the Waldorf Astoria Hotel where there's this abandoned train car. I, it was incredible. But I still wasn't sure if it would work as a setting because – you know, the first two books were at residences where people live, mm -hmm. and Grand Central is a transportation hub, and I just wasn't quite sure about it. But then as I did some research, I learned about the Grand Central School of Art, and that there was this amazing school of art there for 20 years, co-founded by John Singer Sargent, 900 students a year. It just sounded so romantic, and, you know, I could kind of explore the fine arts, which is something that I knew a little about, but I thought I could bring that out in the book as well. And and it just took off from there. And that really was the, the key that pulled me into it. Well, I always love how in your books you pick two timelines and they, you know, collide. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I love that because, you know, with each one of your books, you picked it out and it's like, you know, to do 1928, like right before the Depression. And, you know, pick that year and then 1974 when it was not doing so well and they were trying to figure out whether to keep it or not, which I'm so happy they did. I'm sure everybody is, you know, but it, I love like that you make those two timelines work for it. Yeah, you know, and it's a, it's a real key. Once I know the timelines, then I know the story. And I'm, I, I'm, I've tapped into the story, and I know I can make it work. And, the, you know, 1920s made a lot of sense because that's when the Grand Central School of Art first opened. And it really is capturing a city and an art world in flux between, you know, the heady days of the 1920s and the roaring, the roaring 20s and the Jazz Age, and then knowing that the Depression is going to hit soon. Mm -hmm. And so that was fun because there's just inherent – conflict and drama in that time period. And then the 1970s made sense because I hadn't worked in that decade before in any of the other books, and I wanted to keep it fresh. But 1974, exactly right, is when the, um, the terminal was threatened um, because these developers wanted to put this 55-story uh, kind of skyscraper on top, kind of perch it on top of it, which would have completely ruined it. And they went to court and got the landmark status of Grand Central revoked. And the problem with the 70s was the city had no money to fight back. It was almost bankrupt. So it wasn't until people like Jackie O stepped in and formed a committee to try to save the terminal that things started to turn around. So, again, it was this pivotal point in the city's history as well as Grand Central's history. Yeah, and I did a little bit of reading on it because um, I knew that Penn Station had been completely, you know, 
destroyed in the 1960s. And yeah. I can only imagine that, you know, 10 years later, everybody, I think that everybody started to take like, wait, do we want something else that's here destroyed? You know, like, yeah. I, you know, like, I think they, I think New Yorkers themselves kind of like had to really step back and think about it too. Like, right. Because not a lot of people were happy about the Penn Station, you know, destruction after it happened. And, you know, they were like, wait, you know, here's this beautiful building. Are we going to destroy it for another high rise? You know, is that what's going to happen? And so exactly. it, was, it was very interesting to read, you know, read a little bit about it. But, um, yeah, first of all, the title. Okay, I love your titles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love a short title. You know, it's like, I don't know. That's how I am. And so when it was called The Masterpiece, I was like, that's perfect. That was such a perfect title for this. Although I have to say, as I thought about that, I thought that opens it up for critics to say, The Masterpiece is not. <laughs> and I thought, mm. oh, no. But luckily that hasn't happened. But, yeah, I love the idea of looking at the terminal as an, as a, an artwork in itself. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a sculpture in a way. It's a living sculpture. And is it worthy of saving or not? Just as the character in the book in the 1970s section, Virginia, finds this old painting and wants to find out more about the painter and is it valuable and, um, you know, is that a masterpiece or not? And so I love the way that worked. And I mm -hmm. have to give a full credit to all my titles to my agent because I'm terrible at them. <laughs> and if that were up to me, it would have been called something ridiculous. And she somehow every time comes up with something that we all go, oh, of course. So, so yes, that is my agent's work. <laughs> right, because it's like, you know, it's the art, you know, it's like, I don't know. And then that itself is, you know what I love doing when I go there? Because I go there at least once a year and um, is watch people when they walk in the door. Yes. Like for the first time. You can tell. You can tell the people that, you know, are there all the time and they're not really paying attention. But you see that look on someone's face when they walk through. I don't care what door. There's lots of doors. But they walk through the door <laughs> and they see the, that, that terminal, you know, like just the, the painting and the, and the architecture. And they just look around and they're like, oh, my God. Because I don't think there are words to describe it. So <laughs> I, I agree. And, you know, what you brought up about Penn Station is the same thing. It was this beautiful cathedral of glass and cast iron, and it was completely destroyed. And I, I encourage anyone who wants to read, you know, a historical fiction book about that is to check out Camille de Mayo's The Way of Beauty. Oh, my gosh. Because oh. she sets it right in that time she period. She really does. That is right? So, I'm so glad that you said that. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I had done a lot of research when I had interviewed her. I had done some research then on that. And I'm so glad you connected it because I was like, that's right. I, oh, I completely, yeah. it's, that's such an amazing book. So, yes. Check that book out. It's it's so cool. Um, and then, okay, so I'm looking at the cover, and everybody's looking at the cover. And, you know, so what can you tell us? I mean, it's it's just brilliant. I mean, like you yeah. said, it's like that walking in. It's got that feel, you know, on the upper level, looking down, you know. Yes, yes. And it, it was designed by Christopher Lynn, who is just an amazing art director at Dutton. Um, and it, it I love how he – you know, it's this woman standing on this balcony looking over Grand Central. And what's interesting is if you go into Grand Central today, you'll notice that there's an, a staircase um, across the way. Mm -hmm. And he, he was smart enough to know that that staircase was added later. And so in the, oh, so that's why you don't see it. So it's historically accurate, which I love. <laughs> I didn't even know that. I didn't realize that that staircase was added later. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, but I love, you know, the, the concourse with the clock in the center of it. Yeah. I, I just think he, he did a brilliant job. And, and really, that was the way it was. That's how it came. I didn't have to, you know, change a thing. I thought it was gorgeous. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to read everybody the first line of the book. And it's a little long for a first line, but I just I thought it, it summed this whole book up so beautifully. Um, you say, Clara Darden's illustration class at the Grand Central School of Art tucked under copper eaves of the terminal was unaffected by the trains that rumbled through ancient layers of Manhattan shift hundreds of feet below. And it's like, it was such a beautiful sentence. Did you, like, work on that for a long time? Or <laughs> <laughs> I did. I think that was around the second or third draft that that kind of coalesced into oh. existence. Uh, you know, there's always I, – I tend to write a, a fast first draft knowing that I will go back and make it pretty and better. And, um, and yeah, that sentence grew over multiple drafts in terms of 
nuance in what I was trying to say because I find in the first draft I'm I'm focused on kind of the plot and and mm-hmm. will the characters are they making sense is it all working out and because there's always a sense of mystery in my books that has to right. take precedence to make this make sure the story works and then yeah but once I once I got that right I thought oh yeah this sounds good <laughs> oh yeah and then I always love the last line of the first chapter because I always feel like as a reader we need to be taken to that second chapter because it's too easy to set down after the first one. So it's like we always need to be brought into the second chapter. And and you say, unwilling to give Mr. Lorette any further satisfaction at her distress, Clara stormed out without uttering a reply. And I thought that that set up her personality so well for what's to come. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I loved it. it. I, like, stopped and paused, and I was like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good, good. Yeah, that's a, she's a, she's a hard-headed woman, and she's based on a real illustrator named um, Helen Dryden, who really made a splash and did over 90 Vogue covers in the 1910s and 20s, and then disappeared. And um, And so, you know, she sounded, from what I read about, Helen Dryden, she was a tough nut. And I wanted to make a character who was not soft and careful. You know, I wanted her to be out of step with her time period. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and and Clara definitely is. Yeah, I mean, whenever I read a book that's in the 1920s, I think about my grandmother's. Uh, one of them was, would have been like a teenager during the 20s. And, and so I always like oh. to go feel, have that feel. You know, like, what was it like? What was it like for women back then? And I, that's why I loved her so much, you know, because I, I, I hope they were a little spunky like that. <laughs> <A> little, <laughs> right? I know. And I think they were. I think they had to be quieter about it, but I think they were. I think they were, too. My my grandmother ended up owning her own business that oh. to this day, like, I am, I still wish she were here to tell me how she did that. <laughs> Yeah, she sounds like she deserves her own historical fiction novel. She, you know what? She really kind of does. I wish I could write that, but <laughs> you know, but for you know, for that age, like to be like that, and and you know, so I always love, I, I love, I loved living in that time period. But I did love living in the seventies too, because mm-hmm. I was growing up in the seventies, and I thought you did. Oh, I just, I, I loved them both. But I always do. When I read, when I watched our other interview, I kept saying that to you over and over again. I couldn't decide which time period. I couldn't decide. Which <laughs> and you did that again, so you know oh, that is that good. is quite a quite an accomplishment, you know. Oh. I can say that again. Thank you. The same way, but anyway, the ending we won't, you know, we won't touch on because I just want to tell you that you know I cried, and oh, it was good. beautiful. Good. It was beautiful. It was happy tears, and it was good. it was so beautiful. And um, so we don't do spoilers, no. but um, okay. So you've come out with three books in August. Three years in a row. So yep. are we going for another year? Like, are you, you know, kind of ramping up for another one? I am. I'm. I was just editing it before you called. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's it's um it takes place at the Chelsea Hotel. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's um during the McCarthy era, and it's oh from the God. point of view of of two women. One's a playwright. One's an actress. And um, so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'm having a good time with it. I'm sitting here. You can't see me, but my mouth is open. I'm like, oh, my God, I already, but this time I have to wait, like, even longer to be able to read it. But... I'll write as fast as I can, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that you know, I said it before, but, I mean, you know, having your books take place in New York City is so brilliant because there's so much history to go around, like, you know, I think you could do it every August from now till, you know, the next 40 years and, and it'd be okay. <laughs> okay. By the end, I'd be like, I'm doing the gas station at <laughs> the <laughs> and, and 44th. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's just so much. But that, that's amazing. I can't wait for that. So, everyone, I'm going to have Fiona's link listed below. I'm going to be giving away one of these books on my Instagram. And thank you. Thank you so much for talking with me again. Oh, thank you. It is my absolute pleasure. Thank and you will, for everything make, you do. We we will make a date next year. This yeah. time. <laughs> you bet. I'm in. I'm in. Oh, thank you, Fiona. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to my talk with Fiona. She is awesome. And yes, I didn't turn my phone off. Um, anyway, I love her so much. I'm going to be listing the link below of our first talk. And um, the masterpiece is incredible. Guys, I'm going to be giving away a copy on Instagram tonight. So go to the Writing Fun Instagram account. I'll put the link below and you can win a copy. And I am so excited for her. Thank you, Fiona.